uh, hopefully we'll get to all three of them, three of my favorite Israeli novelists. Uh, but let me start by saying it's really a privilege and an honor uh, to be part of this tribute to uh, my Marrakez, my teacher, my friends, Mel Riesfield, Zichrono, Livracha. Uh, Mel inspired me to have a much friendlier relationship with the Hebrew language, uh, uh, which uh, should not be taken for granted because I've been force fed Hebrew in Hebrew school and uh, two summers in Camp Ramah. And uh, uh, Mel gave me a much more affectionate orientation, which ultimately led to my ability to read these novelists uh, in their original language. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a few books today. I'm gonna to mostly focus on books that have, all, that have been translated into uh, English so that you can uh, access them even if you can't read the original. If you can read them in Hebrew, uh, it's always worth uh, the effort. Um, I'm gonna start with Aleph Bet Yoshua. Aleph Bet Yoshua is 85, he's still writing today. He is the last literary lion uh, of his generation in Israel. Uh, he is a man deeply engaged with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with issues of Jewish identity, the relationship between Israel and the diaspora. He was a lifelong activist. He, beca he became a peace activist together with Amos Oz, and he said that they became friends in order to prevent professional jealousy. Uh, you can find him talking politics all over YouTube, so I don't want to go into his political views right now. I want to focus on his novels. Yoshua, unlike Amos Oz and most of the Israeli novelists who have been widely translated into English, uh, is not Ashkenazi. His mother immigrated from Morocco uh, in 1932, and his father was a, was a fifth generation Sephardic Jew from Jerusalem. His most recent novel is The Tunnel, uh, published two years ago in 2020 in English. And he's already published another short novel in Hebrew called Habata Yechida, The Only Daughter, which is supposed to be coming out uh, in English in November. So um, I want to start with the, uh, uh, the opening of his very first novel, which was also the first book that I dared to read in Hebrew, uh, which is called Hame Ahev, uh, The Lover. And uh, one of the main characters is speaking. Uh, the book is entirely told in the voice of different characters. And this is Adam, or Adam, the owner of a successful and growing auto repair shop uh, in Haifa. With a, uh, he, he barely has a high school education, but he's a master mechanic. He's a very pricey mechanic, and he never tells his customer the costs of the work until it's done. And they all pay up because they're intimidated by him by his bulk and his bushy beard and his expertise in car mechanics in the face of their own uh, ignorance. Uh, so talk about, uh, you know, Jewish uh, diaspora stereotypes. Uh, as the novel moves along, Adam becomes increasingly involved with his own obsessions and he helps people, goes out of his way to help some people and does enormous damage to other people uh, in the process. Now this novel takes place during and after the Yom Kippur War in 1973, and it was written in 1977, and up until then, Yoshu had only published short stories. Uh, uh, by the way, in the, in the lines I'm gonna to read to you, he refers to a Morris. A Morris is a car. It was a British car uh, from 1947. So at the time this novel is taking place, it's already an antique. Uh, uh, and, and this is the opening section of The Lover Hamehahev. Uh, and in the last war, we lost a lover. We used to have a lover. And since the war, he is gone, just disappeared. He and his grandmother's Morris. And more than six months have passed and there has been no sign from him. Now we're always saying it's a small, intimate country. If you try hard enough, you'll discover links between the most distant people. And now it's as if the man has been swallowed up by the earth, disappeared without a trace, and all the searches have been fruitless. If I was sure he, would, he had been killed, I would have given up the search. What right do we have to be stubborn about a dead lover? There are some people who have lost all that is dear, sons, fathers, and husbands. But how can I put it? Still, I'm convinced he hasn't been killed, not him. I'm sure he never even reached the front. And even if he was killed, where is the car? Where has that disappeared to? You can't just hide a car in the sand. So that's the opening of Yoshua's first novel, The Lover. What an opening. And Yoshua always has a very strong authorial voice, 
we feel like we're in good hands. Like, I mean, in a few lines, look at all the things he's set up. Somebody has a lover and that lover has gone missing in the Yom Kippur War. But comically, he refers to the lover as our lover. We had a lover, the couple, the family, which makes us super curious. What does that mean? Why is he our lover? Was the lover the wife's lover? Was the lover the husband's lover, both of them? Is this the lover of the book's title or will there be other lovers along the way? And we understand already that Adam or Adam wants to find him. He's searching for him. And then to top it all off, he's also searching for the car. He really wants to find that car. So we have a man obsessed with a search, which sounds peculiar to begin with, <coughs> and who seems equally committed to finding a missing person who disappeared in a war and a car, perhaps the car he disappeared in. And in fact, the search will be the driving force for much of this novel, no pun intended. <coughs> now, on the one hand, we have a very personal drama. <clears throat> but Alephet Yoshua is always giving us a social commentary on Israel. He's always slyly slipping in his perspective. <clears throat> and in this case, relating to an issue very close to Mel, to power relations, the relations between Jews and Palestinians, between rich and poor, between young and old, <clears throat> and between men and women. And by the end of the novel, some powerless people will be helped by those people with power, while others will be used in careless and even monstrous ways. Now, for the first half of his career as a novelist, Yoshua played around with point of view a lot. So in The Lover, the story is told, and the same events are often retold by multiple characters. So Adam, the owner of this garage, is one of the characters. <clears throat> Another is his wife, Asya a petite chain smoking high school teacher. And we only ever hear her dreams and her nightmares. But we also hear from their 14 year old daughter, Daphna or Daffy. And she's, a she's insomniac. And she wanders around the house all night and wanders around the neighborhood. And she studies her parents and her best friends. And she tries to hide the fact that she never sleeps from her teachers. We also hear from Verutza, a 93 year old woman who at the start of the story is in a coma. And we hear her disconnected, unconscious in all its free fall, free associations. Now in this guy's garage, he employs an ever increasing number of Arab mechanics and apprentices. <laughs> he doesn't really keep track of them. He has an Arab guy who just brings in <clears throat> all kinds of relatives to work in the garage. Now these are Palestinian citizens of Israel. Uh, so they're all living in the Haifa area. The Haifa is a big mixed city, the largest mixed city in Israel with a large Jewish and Arab population. Then the youngest of all of Adam's Arab workers becomes one of the narrators. His name is Naim, he's 14, and he's kind of an apprentice mechanic and a janitor, does whatever they ask him to do. <clears throat> Let's listen to how Naim thinks about the Jews, at least according to Oliver Yoshua in 1977. And this, this, this comment he's gonna make are right after a terrorist attack has been reported on the radio. This is Naim. They're getting themselves killed again. And when they get themselves killed, we have to shrink and lower our voices and mind not to laugh, even at some joke that's got nothing to do with them. Knowing where to draw the line, that's what matters. And whoever doesn't wanna know had better stay in the village and laugh alone in the fields or sit in the orchard and curse the Jews as long as he likes but those of us who are with them all day have to be careful. No, they don't hate us. Anyone who thinks they hate us is completely wrong. We're beyond hatred for them. We're like shadows, take, fetch, hold, clean, lift, sweep, unload, move. That's what they think of us. But when they start getting killed, they get tired and they slow down and they can't concentrate, and they suddenly get all worked up about nothing, <clears throat> just before the news or just after. The news that we don't exactly hear, for us it's kind of a rustle, but not exactly. We hear the words, but we don't want to understand. <clears throat> <clears throat> when we're working on the cars that they leave with us, <clears throat> the first thing we do is to switch off Radio Israel or the Army Station. The main thing is to have none of that endless chatter <clears throat> about the rotten conflict that'll go on forever. Excuse me, one second.
So we see already Yoshua has empathy, his empathy for all of his characters. <clears throat> and he works hard to try to see their perspectives, but he also is always aware of the absurdity of it all. The cacophony of voices shows there's not any single perspective on what's going on in this country, but also that we should never assume we know <clears throat> what other people are thinking. Now, Yoshua played around with multiple narr narrators for about 25 years. And because of that, he was called the Israeli Faulkner uh, by Harold Bloom, the great critic. Uh, William Faulkner in The Sound and the Fury has four different characters tell the same story, including one develop developmentally disabled man whose communi communication skills are very limited. Um, and Faulkner won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and I would say, if any Israeli writer is deserving to be the second Nobel laureate in literature, <coughs> excuse me, after, after Agnon, it'll be Olivet Yoshua. Now, about 20 years ago, Yoshua completely changed his writing style. He gave up all these experiments and he stuck with a single narrator. And I think he's produced some of his finest work during this, during this period. <coughs> the best to my mind is The Liberated Bride, but I also recommend the Friendly Fire, A Woman in Jerusalem, and The Tunnel, which deals with relations between Jews and Palestinians again. In fact, other than one historical novel, uh, <clears throat> A Journey to the End of the Millennium, set in 999, all these novels can kind of be seen as one continuous story. And the common thread are the main characters. And the first is a married, middle-aged man, a husband, who is always obsessive. He's very bullheaded, but he's also very caring. He's genuinely concerned for the welfare of others, <clears throat> which leads him to uncontrollable meddling in other people's lives. Now in The Liberated Bride, he can't stop interfering in his son's marriage, even though his son has been long divorced. And this turns into, or leads to, brilliant comic moments and occasionally to total disasters. Now the wife is always level-headed, reasonable, is always accomplished in her professional field, and she respects personal boundaries. And she's determined to keep her husband from obsessing himself to death. So from novel to novel, the husband and wife change professions, but not personalities. He's a professor, or he runs an elevator company, or he's a senior road engineer. She's a pediatrician, a judge, a teacher. <coughs> With one exception, they're never artists. Now, in his first 20 years, he wrote about disastrous marriages, but in the past 20 years, the marriage of the, these two main characters is always loving, supportive, and complicated. They are a couple who are equal partners, but also best friends. They bicker their way through a prickly tug of war between caring and correcting each other. They snipe at each other like a lot of us do, but they love each other. They fight and they make up. So if you read any, if you read a lot of contemporary fiction, you'll know that this is a real oddity in today's literary landscape. Marriages are almost always portrayed as toxic and weakening. This couple and this character also reminds me of Mel. Mel and, and Yaffa, their, their solid marriage and Mel's bullheadedness and Yaffa's quiet ability to balance that. Um, and I think that they would have made fantastic characters for an Olive Bet Yoshua <laughs> novel. Um, Don, I'm just going to let you know we're we're going to end at 1 p.m., so you're going to have okay, to readjust. Okay, okay terrific. Um, so, so le let me move on. I'm just going to read you the opening page of The Liberated Bride, so you can see what Yo Yoshua sounds like over the last 20 years. And this is about a professor uh, who has been has been kind of finagled into going to one of his graduate students' weddings. And uh, she's an Arab student, which makes the relationship more complicated. And the professor is in the field of Orientalism. He's trying to uh, uh, write a book explaining the Algerian civil war after the French left Algeria, uh, while also fending off attacks from younger researchers that his entire field, Orientalism, is a colonialist construct and is entirely archaic. <clears throat> so here's what he says. Had he known that on this evening, on the hill where the village held its celebrations, an evening suffused by the scent of a fig tree bent over the table like another venerable guest, he would again be struck, but powerfully, by a sense of failure and missed opportunity 
he might have more decisively made his excuses to Samaher, his annoyingly ambitious MA student, who not content with sending him an invitation by mail and then repeating it to his face, had gone and chartered a minibus after urging the new department head to make sure the faculty attended her wedding. It wasn't just for her sake, she said. It would be a gesture to all the university's Arab students without whom, the cheek of it, the department would count for nothing. His wife, Hagit, who knew all too well how weddings had depressed him in recent years, had warned against it. Why do you need the aggravation, she had asked. But they're Arabs, he'd answered mildly, with the innocence of a man pursuing an academic interest. As opposed to what, she wanted to know. Human beings? On the contrary, on the contrary, he had tried defending himself at a loss to explain how Arabs, although not among the many objects of his envy, could be more human than anybody else. So here again, we see in a very short space, Yoshua's sense of humor, how he skewers all sides, the Jews and the Arabs, <coughs> and how he sees their own neuroses <coughs> constantly trying, constantly undermining their good intentions. I would say that Yoshua loves his characters. He, he mocks them. Uh, but he's able to dissect our prejudices and put them right out there. And in this novel, as I said, there's always a social political commentary. He's comparing the Jewish-Palestinian conflict to flailing marriages, but he finds some hope in this, because as I said in the beginning, there's a loving marriage at the heart of the novel. So he can insinuate an allegorical dimension into a very detailed, realistic drama, uh, which is a neat trick if you can do it. The next writer I want to talk about is Yochi Brandes. Uh, now, Yochi Brandes is 63. She uh, was born into a family uniting two Hasidic dynasties, and she grew up in an ultra-Orthodox community, which, which she left as a young woman to become a writer and a teacher. But she kept her love and her vast knowledge of Jewish texts, Tanakh, Talmud, and Hasidic texts. She's also my neighbor here in Farsaba. <laughs> She's published eight novels, uh, some with contemporary settings, but only two of her novels have been translated into English. They're both historical novels, The Secret Book of Kings <coughs> and The Orchard. Now, the first one, The Secret Book of Kings, is called Malachim Gimel in Hebrew, which is uh, uh, the book of kings, th the third book of kings. So she had the chutzpah to name her book as if it was another book, an additional book in the Bible. And that tells the story of uh, uh, King David and uh, 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 Saul from the side of the losers from the side of the people who didn't get to write the history book or the biblical book celebrating David, but rather the line of King Saul. Um, now, Yochi Brandes always puts her women at the center of the story, and she tries to find the place <clears throat> where she can tell about a revolution in Judaism. That's her focus. So in this one, it's, it's the temple, the first temple being established, which is centralizing the whole country. In her next book, uh, Akiva's Orchard, Apardesha Akiva, which in English is called uh, just the Orchard, she focuses on the beginning of rabbinic Judaism. Now again, her commitment to text, to Jewish history, to Jewish identity, all make me think of Mel, because he cared about all these things. Now the most famous Jewish woman to suffer in solitude uh, for the sake of her husband's Torah study was, of course, Rachel, the wife of Rabbi Akiva. And Rachel is the narrator of this book. She's the narrator of The Orchard. So in this novel, in The Orchard, she's portrayed as the daughter of a very wealthy family. She's intended to be married to a leading rabbi, but instead she chooses a shepherd named Akiva. And Akiva isn't even Jewish. He's a Gentile who has come to work for the Jews, but Rachel falls in love with him. And when she falls in love with him, he's illiterate. Now, they're both extreme personalities, brilliant and passionate, but in a patriarchal culture, only Akiva can make his way publicly. But Rachel is the motivating force. She's the one pushing him always from behind. She teaches Akiva to read, and then she pushes him to become a learned Jew. And finally, she sends him off to yeshiva with orders not to return until he has become a great rabbi which Akiva, also an extreme personality, takes very literally. And he never returns home during all the years that he mm -hmm. studied to become a rabbi. In the meantime, her family has cut her off, and she has to support her children by selling her hair or working menial jobs. 
Now she waits in poverty for 12 years or for 24 years, depending on which version of the story you're reading, while Akiva evolves from an illiterate shepherd to the leading rabbi of his time. Rachel, for her part, becomes a prophet. And she suffers a lot because her visions are extremely accurate. But the novel pivots around Akiva's journey. Now to Yochi Brandis's credit, her empathy for Rachel and trying to rewrite the story of Judaism and Jewish history to put the women back in does not lead her to turn Akiva into a villain. In her novel though, Brandis imagines as many of the debates that would have taken place when rabbinic Judaism, the Judaism we all know, was founded. Now, what does she do? She has the material she's working from are rabbi tales. What are rabbi tales? Those are the stories about the rabbis from the first few centuries, the Talmudic period. Uh, they're written in the Talmud. They're about Hillel or Shammai or Akiva or Rabban Gamliel or Rabbi Yochanan or Reish Lakish. And these are, these are not commentaries. These are not uh, legal deliberations. They're closer to the stories of Christian saints or wonder-working Hasidic rabbis, the kind of stories that would be written 1,500 years later. And the, the rabbis don't necessarily exhibit exemplary behavior. Some of the stories are tragic, some are didactic, some are baffling, but Brandy's brilliantly incorporates all these stories into her narrative. Now, what's the challenge they're facing at that time? The rabbis have to figure out how Judaism will survive despite the destruction of the temple and the continued rule of Rome in Palestine. Jews can't make sacrifices at the temple. There's no way to atone for your sins. There's no way to thank God for things you're grateful for. So Judaism is gonna to have to be reinvented. So Yochi Brandis imagines Rabbi Akiva as a charismatic leader and as a radical thinker. He's the first one to challenge the accepted interpretations of the other rabbis. And then he goes further. He comes up with a revolutionary way of interpreting the Torah, which he calls Midrash. And that attracts to him lots of young followers. I'm sure you can think of teachers today who, who, are, who are, you know, are beacons to, to the young. And Akiva's new Midrash is meant to take the place of the temple, to reinvent and reboot Judaism. But he's also a populist. He opens the gates of the yeshiva to everybody. Torah for everyone, not just for the brilliant scholars, not just for the next rabbis in training. And his imaginative leaps totally exasperate his colleagues and it, things divide up into rival schools. And Brandis imagines this entire world. Now all this is happening while the Romans are running Palestine. And at the same time, another group, the Nazarenes, what she calls the, what her name for the early Christians, are also starting to attract hearts and minds. And this battle, this political battle and this battle on hearts and minds goes on while Yochi Brandis reimagines the beginning of the Judaism that we all live. For example, she tells us a story about inventing tefillot, inventing the services that we know, the Amidah. The, the rabbis are arguing over the 18 prayers that are gonna be in the Amidah. <coughs> I'll read you a little section here where Rachel is trying to get together with another woman to get the rabbis to come together one night because they're going to invent a new way to celebrate Passover. And the thing they're gonna invent is the Passover Seder. But the rabbis are all fighting with each other. So she has to get them to overcome their egos in order to create something together. <clears throat> Her voice is choked. The Passover Seder is the order of the day. All the greatest sages will take part in its institution, all of them except for Rabbi Eliezer. <coughs> I, my decision is stated directly and without embellishment. The Seder will be established in our home so that Rabbi Eliezer can take part. Rabbi Eliezer wouldn't agree to go to the Seder <coughs> that was supposed to be in one of the yeshivas. <coughs> <coughs> All the invited guests confirm their plans to attend. The eight greatest sages of the nation of Israel will, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> will gather around the holiday table that I will set for them, and they will establish a Seder for the eve of Passover on behalf of the nation of Israel. But sitting together as brothers is not enough to assure the success of this encounter. <coughs> 
if they are not moved by the spirit of compromise, there will not be one agreed upon Seder established that night, but rather two Seders, which will only deepen the dispute. So she imagines this whole world, uh, and in the end, the Passover Seder is created in B'nai Brak. And we read that story about that all night study session in the, in the Passover Haggadah every single year at the Seder. Now, what about the Pardes, the orchard? That's the title of the book. That's from the iconic tale of four rabbis who uh, encountered the mystical orchard, the realm of visions, usually seen as the uh, encounter with the essence of God and existence. One becomes an apostate, another goes mad, a third dies. And what happens to them? What do they see inside that mystical orchard that has such extreme reactions? Only Rabbi Akiva comes out unscathed. But Rabbi Akiva, as we know, backs the Bar, Kokhba, the Bar Kokhba rebellion, which ultimately leads to the complete destruction of the Jewish people in Palestine. <clears throat> Yochi Brandis's imagination is very rich, and she actually tells us what those rabbis experienced in that mystical encounter. Now, I'm not going to tell it to you, because you, you really have to read this book to read, to find out <clears throat> what her answer is, because it's brilliant, it's moving, and it's not a bunch of mystical, uh, mushy thought. And she's got a very clear idea of what they experienced and what caused them to have such extreme responses. Um, I would say that, like her portrait of Rabbi Akiva as a revolutionary darshan, as a reinterpreter of Jewish texts, in reworking the rabbi tales, Yoki Brandish herself is reinterpreting old texts in an entirely new way. And she's a modern darshan. She's answering a call that few other Israeli artists ever even hear, let alone address with the depth of Jewish learning that she brings to her subject. So again, I think Mel did the same thing for us. He retold the Jewish story. He kept finding the language to make it relevant. I mean, we know how easy it is to lose touch with young people and uh, you know, to think that Mel could keep this up at Tel Yehuda for 35 years and throughout his life for much longer than that is, is truly, truly amazing. We are, we are running out of time here. So I think- um, I would like you for me one favor. Sure. Each one of your authors and books that you're recommending for the recording. Yes, uh, the, the, the authors I'm recommending are first of all, Aleph Bet Yoshua, uh, uh, and you can start with his first book, The, the Lover or The Liberated Bride, or his last book. I actually read the, his books backwards during Corona uh, when the tunnel came out, and that took me back to his books of the last 20 years. Um, you can also uh, uh, look at Yoki Brandis' book, The Secret Book of Kings or The Orchard, uh, which is out in English. All of these are also in very good, very readable translations. The author I'm not going to really get to, uh, maybe I'll read you one little section here to end with, is Meir Shalev. Meir Shalev is a guy who writes about the founders of the state, but he is a uh, anything but looking at the founders of the state uh, as sacred cows. He uh, he sees uh, he he both honors them and parodies them at the same time. I just want to read you the first for the beginning of the Blue Mountain, which was his very first novel called uh, uh, Roman Rusi, a Russian Russian novel. That was the name in Hebrew. Russian novel, meaning had a big, many, many characters and they were all very passionate. So I, I just have to end with this because this also connects to me something to Mel. I think Mel would have really enjoyed this. One summer night, the old school teacher, Yaakov Pines, awoke from his sleep with a great start. I'm screwing Lieberson's granddaughter, someone <laughs> had shouted outside. High, brazen and clear, the shout winged past the Canary Isle pine trees near the water tower. For a moment, it hovered like a bird of prey before swooping earthward to the village. The old teacher felt a familiar twinge of pain. Once more, he alone had heard the obscene words. Pines sat up in bed and wiped his fingers on the hair on his chest, perplexed and enraged that life in the village could go on as usual when such debauchery publicly thumbed and nose at it. So I don't think I have to embellish that anymore. <laughs> I think Mel would have enjoyed that. Um, so if, if this at all has whet your appetite to read, 
uh, Mayor Shalev or Yochi Brandis uh, or Aleph Bet Yeshua or any of the many other amazing Israeli novelists, uh, I will uh, feel that we've done, done our job today.